five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Plasma Apocalypse Thursday. I actually didn't have an intro. I, I forgot. To, I'm doing some stuff, so I, I forgot to put the intro in there. So lame intro, but really cool uh, subject matter today. Uh, I believe I have everything set up. I saved one of the most interesting theories for a little later. I want to do a little more study on it before I started talking about it, but it's something that's popped up in my research, in my daily life quite often. And it's something that, uh, it's okay. When we're talking about the plasma apocalypse, we talk about a lot of different things. And normally I actually, I pray a little, I play a little prequel about the plasma apocalypse, uh, before this particular segment. I, I d didn't include that this time because I'm still working on some stuff. So if you'd like to know more and you're a stranger to the plasma apocalypse, um, I did a breadcrumb video about it. It's like a seven minute long video. Go check it out. It's called what is the plasma apocalypse? So let me welcome everyone in the chat. Let me just go ahead and I'm going to pull the chat out a little bit here. Now I do have the circuits of time open. So if you're a member on that tier, you can call in at any point during the show. I'm not going to reserve a certain time for that or anything. Um, if we get too many calls in, then I'll just, I'll shut down Skype for a little bit so we can continue on. But hey, what's up everyone? So I'm Jay Dreamers and today we're talking about the plasma apocalypse, which basically is the cyclical uh, end of the world and at the same time, the beginning of the world. It's basically that point in time where magic enters back into our world in the form of an influx of electromagnetic activity, aka one of those forms is plasma in various ways. And today uh, we've talked about plasma uh some subjects of the plasma apocalypse that we've talked about are uh, the, the sun turning off, the, the moon breaking apart. We've talked about uh, people getting sucked up, gravity basically turning off or electromagnetism hitting the neutral point during the polar shift and uh, the sky opening up, our world depressurizing, uh, things getting sucked up into the sky. Uh, the oceans are no more. They're gone. The phantasoids uh, of various forms and types entering into our world. And, you know, they've gone by many names as well. But today, there's many other elements, but today we're going to talk about uh, the possibility of the plasma that enters into our world because of this influx, possibly reshaping DNA and possibly, I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to help to reshape DNA in many different ways. But one of those ways is uh, possibly changing people into animals and vice versa. Also changing uh, animals into people. It sounds like my mic's a little too loud right now. Let me turn it down a little bit. Is that better? How about right here? I don't know. I didn't realize the microphone was so loud. No wonder it's so super loud in my ears. Is that, is that a little better? I don't want it to be crackly or anything. Let me know in the chat if the, it sounds good. It's, it's not in the red right now, so it should be okay. Uh, huge shout out. Thank you, Mother Dragon, so much. Uh, for offering to give me help with the Skype call-ins. I appreciate it. If you want to call in, remember, you have to have Skype. I do plan on getting the phone number uh, for Skype so that people can just call in from their regular cell phones or smartphones or corded phones, if you still have those, <laughs> or a pay phone. That would be kind of cool. All right. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to go through a lot of different pictures. These are these these images. I didn't have time to actually put them up in any particular order, but the concept of people changing into animals has been seen throughout our history, throughout our uh, pop culture, throughout our books and our movies and our ancient uh, historical records or historic records. Um, it's And it's something that I feel like has always been dismissed. It's always been, eh, okay, that's a metaphor for something else. Eh, that's a metaphor too. Oh, that's symbolic. That's okay. Well, at what point are these millions of examples of people changing into animals? At what point are they no longer symbolic, but we have to start taking them literally? Like, like there's a possibility that this actually does exist. And I'm not really talking about like slow evolution over time, how schools teach or academics teach. I'm talking about very quick transitions because it's my belief based on my studies so far that these, these uh, epic changes that our world goes through from time to time, whether it be uh, the inundation 
of plasma into our world and our world being amped up with electromagnetic power or the introduction of the oceans or I almost said oceans, but that's not quite right. There's only one ocean, right? Which is the biggest example of worldwide flooding. I mean, come on, that's pretty much what that is, right? Um, or the mountains, ancient records talk about how the mountains were not made gradually over millions of years by wind and rain and eh, no, sorry. The mount, the ancient records talk about how the mountains were literally made, uh, it momentarily, like in moments, um, it didn't take too long for the mountains to just rise up out of the ground. And I believe many of these earth changes take place rather quickly around the time of the plasma apocalypse. This is when the most craziest stuff is happening to our world. And if you're not familiar with it, just the gist of it basically is that there is plasma wrapped around our world. Uh, there is an electromagnetic barrier. There is literally a force field around our world. Academics refers to it as Van Allen belts and some other things. Uh, but if you look at the layers of our atmosphere, you'll see one of those layers is literally the plasma sphere. There is a whole bunch of plasma, what they call tubes up there, wrapping around and wiggling around our world. Well, the theory is basically that um, there comes a point in time when the energy buildup reaches maximum, and that's when we see the polarity of our world start to shift or the poles shift in our world. And when that happens, um, basically a hole opens up in our sky. And when that hole opens up in our sky, our world depressurizes and that plasma, that 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 energetic force field that's keeping the plasma out and wrapping around our world goes down. And that plasma now is able to come into our world through the openings in the sky. And that's when you get the sky falling and chicken little and all of all of those types of stories. All right. Let me give you some quick shout outs. Semyaza is in the chat. Brit, good to see you guys. Mother Dragon. Unlearn the system, of course. Hey, unlearn the system. You got your new uh, your new badge thing. That's pretty cool. The next one, I believe, is the Yeti for you. That's pretty sweet. Uh, Vegan Demon is in the chat. Maria Beckos. Vegan Demon says, Dreamers, do you think the Earth always had water or only after the flood? No, the Earth goes through periods where it has an inundation of water and then an inundation of fire. It's inundated with those things. It's filled up with those things. The next one for us is going to be fire. I don't know if it's going to... I don't think it's actually going to be like fire how we're used to it but basically plasma fire is a type of plasma and that plasma is what we're t we're focusing on next because i believe that is the next thing to come the flooding was before and it goes through these periods of being washed out and then uh burned burned away basically and a lot of these records talk about that jessica coker and michael McCowan. what's up everyone all right so uh the subject what this is called humans turning into animals is called therianthropy therian Therapy, therianthropy. So let's see here. I think this is what we're going to do. I'm not going to go to Wikipedia. That's kind of boring, right? Let's get right to the exciting stuff. How about that? That sounds good to me. Don't want to really get into Wikipedia right now. Maybe we'll save that for the end because we all know what we're talking about, right? People turning into animals. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the the little examples, the breadcrumbs that I have found. And it really like, okay, let me back up. I, it seems to me, and, and for those of you who are new, um, a lot of people say like, Hey Jay, where do you get your information from? Like, why don't you quote your sources and list your materials? And no, oh, I understand that I do. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat. Okay. Right off the, the top of my dome here. Lots of my information comes from within. Lots of my information are intuitive feelings that I get when I pay attention to my life and what's happening inside of me and around me. That's where a lot of that information comes from because I recognize and know we live, I live in a fractal verse where it's the same within as it is without. So there is no n desperate need for me to go find other people's works and other people's information, although it often does help and falls into my lap at just the right time, because if you seek, you shall find, right? Uh, but a lot of the information basically comes from intuition, a gut feeling, um, my creative mind, a lot of that. Now, I'm not saying all of it, but I want to give a huge shout out to my own creativity and my own intuition, not just mine, but all of yours. 
And I believe we're entering into a time where we need to focus more on that. So we're talking about therianthropy and people turning into animals. Now, a lot of times I have found that whenever I come across these breadcrumbs, especially in the movies, like you can see right here behind me, this is from Ghostbusters 2. And the reason I like this one so much is because these people right here are essentially getting hit by plasma, right? They're becoming the plasma possessed. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're going to turn into uh, these hellhounds, these dogs, basically, in the movie. Actually, they're going to they're gonna be petrified as well, which is another part of the plasma apocalypse, is petrification. And uh, I got a lot of information on that, too, just so just check out my mud fossil videos. But I have talked about petrification as a weapon and natural petrification from the plasma itself or from the large plasma trunks, the larger sections of plasma that reach down and ground to our world. So let me give uh, let's let's check out some cool pictures here. So this one's from Ghostbusters. Now this uh, they call plasma in Ghostbusters ectoplasm, which means plasma outside of outside of what? Well, outside of the body, because the ectoplasm represents spirits and ghosts. And you know what I mean? That's why they're ghost busting. And that's why they use plasma to bust the ghosts, because you have to use the plasma to fight the plasma, basically, or use electromagnetics to fight uh, electromagnetic beings, basically. So I found a lot of times that whenever I've seen this example of people changing into animals, especially in pop culture, movies and books, that it's usually some sort of person or character that is a bad guy or somebody that um, has some serious defects when it comes to like their moral standard or something. And so basically they're turned into an animal as a form of punishment. And that actually reminds me, let me make sure I have something in here. I'm going to add something to my notes right now before I forget this. Okay, so I was just typing into the computer here, Nebuchadnezzar from uh, the Bible, basically. Biblical character. I want to talk about him, too. All right, so let's go through some of these images here. The first one I have down, I'm just going to flip through some of these. I don't. It's, it's okay if we don't get a surprise, but uh, Beauty and the Beast, classic one, right? A classic example of somebody who was punished and as a form of punishment for their bad energy, the bad vibe that they carried, the bad or not bad, bad's, pol bad's a, a, a polarity word, right? So it's a more base vibration or basic vibration or selfish vibration, right? Vibes that are sucking everything in instead of putting everything out, right? Basically, that's a, a, probably a better way to describe it. So this punishment was for him to turn into a beast, right? They changed this beautiful human being guy into this ugly beast or whatever. Well, that wasn't the end of the story. It was a love story between Belle and the beast. Or oh, we'll get to him in a second. So here's the weird thing, right? This is a, this is a socially acceptable story of uh, relationships with animals, Okay, to put that politely, right? Why is it socially acceptable? Because he ends up turning back into a human? I don't know about that. Here's the question. If he was purely animal, if there is a such thing as being purely animal, would Bell have had such affections for him? Or was it the fact that he was a human who had been turned into an animal or into a beast or into a chimera or chimera, however you want to say it. Um, I believe that that's probably the case. And there was there are many stories that I've come across as well, and I'm still coming across, where um, a, a human fell in love with an animal who had, prior to becoming an animal, had been human. And that's the whole, hey, it's okay type thing, right? Uh, of course, there's other stories as well. But yeah, we've got Beauty and the Beast. Basically, there was the witch that turned him into the beast, Right? Because he was he was a selfish guy and he was full of himself. He was full of vanity and he just thought he was the bee's knees, you know, like and nothing could touch him. He was very holier than thou and, uh, you know, he was on his high horse all the time. So he turned into a high horse. <laughs> all right. So this one I hear is from Brother Bear. Now in Brother Bear, it's really cool because they talk about the Aurora Borealis essentially being spirit. Not electromagnetic phenomena. And if you talk to the Inuit or any of the, uh, you know, some people call the Inuit Eskimos. That's that's not actually the name for them, but they're, they're the Inuit. And if you ask the Inuit, they'll talk to you as well as other older tribes. Um, they'll talk to you about the Aurora Borealis and how that 
is spirit or even the spirit of the world where all the spirits go up and basically hang out. Okay, that's like a simple, simplified way of putting it. But in the movie, this kid gets turned into a bear, right? And um, I don't remember the whole movie. I just wanted to put him getting turned into a bear. But I think it was because like he wasn't a good person, I want to say. But I don't know. That's totally speculation on my part. But often it is that the people are turned into animals because of how they were acting or what vibration they carried. That vibration is not just like, oh, do I enjoy their presence or do I not enjoy their presence? That's got nothing to do with it. It has to do with the literal frequency that is moving about through and in their DNA, right? So their DNA changes in order to match something else. This one right here is from the movie Brave where her mom, I don't I don't know Brave's mom. I don't know the girl's name. I'm sorry. Uh, but when her mom gets changed into a bear as a form of punishment, basically, and there was an even worse bad guy in this movie. Um, and, uh, the worst bad guy, he was turned in, he was changed into a bear as well. The thing was that they didn't realize that the, the bear, the bad guy bear in this movie used to be human. They all just thought it was just a bear, like just really evil bear or whatever. And I've noticed in my personal life that I've seen a lot of people who really remind me of animals. Like they have some serious animal qualities going on. You know what I mean? Sometimes animals, sometimes I can see other things in people. I could see wizards in people. I could see trolls in people. I can see, um, I can see giants in people. I can see all kinds of things that sort of have an echo of something that may have been at some point in time, right? Uh, let's see. Vegan Demon says, Jay Dreamers, do you think the earth always... Oh, I already read that one. Uh, let's see. Oh, here it is. Vegan Demon says, Jay Dreamers, I read that the plasma tubes converge at the 33rd par parallel of the celestial sphere. I have not read that, but that is interesting. Uh, leave a link if you have some information on that. Let's see here. Oh, hey, Mother Mother Dragon says to check out Frozen 2. I have not seen that one yet. She says that it's an entire one hour and 43 minutes worth of the subject and its potential outcome for when uh, it is forced to happen. Okay, well, I'm going to check out Frozen 2, I promise. Oh, Merida, thank you. That's her name. Now, this one right here is Beast from, uh, from X-Men, right? All of the X-Men, in my opinion... It, the, well, first of all, there are no there are no made up stories in our world. OK, every single movie is a part of our reality. It is a part of our story that we have gone through and will continue to go through because we live in this sort of uh, cyclical loop. Right. And the plasma apocalypse is sort of marks the beginning and end or the transition period in that loop. Um, but all of the X-Men basically are what we will see after the plasma apocalypse because of the influx of electromagnetics. It's going to affect people psychically. It's going to affect people electro, uh, electro electronically and magnetically. So you're going to see this actually happen. These will be the X-Men or the men of the X and the X is basically marking the spot, uh, to either the inner earth, the inner earth or and or the North Pole itself, or uh, above the North Pole, which is the spot in the sky where the hole opens up. But as you can see right here, first of all, he's blue, which harkens back to the ancient blue gods, right? And he turns into a beast. That's his X-Men power. Well, they get their powers from radiation is usually what it is, right? That's almost always where like any superhero is getting his power from. Some, some, some mysterious form of radiation. Well, that mysterious form of radiation is probably electromagnetics in the form of plasma is my guess right now. And uh, that's why they all have these sort of uh, electromagnetic powers, basically. But Beast is a little different. He doesn't really have electromagnetic powers. His DNA just changes, right? And it changes rather quickly, as you can see. This is also from the remake, the live the live action scene of Beauty and the Beast. I just want to throw this in there because it's kind of a beautiful uh, image. Also has the roses going around in circles around him. Uh, that could symbolize the plasma apocalypse because we know that the Rosicrucians, uh, they're basically those of the rosy cross. The cross is the center of the world. The rose is that red eye in the sky, the red rose up in the sky, which is also why in Logan's Run, when they have that weird ceremony where everybody dresses up in their little fiery spandex leotards or whatever, and they all start floating up into that, uh, and there's like that red crystal thing, that scene is upside down. It actually should look 
Uh, you got to flip it upside down to understand it better. But that's the rose in the middle of that one too. Okay, th this is also from Beauty and the Beast. As you can see, there's this magic around him. You see, we dismiss these types of things. Instead of taking them literal and saying, what could that be? We just dismiss them and we say, oh, it's look, it's, it's magic that's changing him. Well, yes, let's change the word magic, which we, we kind of use as a bland coverall for anything we don't understand. And let's change that into, at the very least, some form of light, some kind of an aurora, possibly plasma that's surrounding this guy and changing him into an animal, right? At this mask or at this sort of ball that they have going on, which is really interesting where everybody's wearing white. Uh, let's see. Hey, if you're in the chat, if you want to get my attention, just type in at JDreamers. Let me make sure that we're still streaming. All right, cool. The health is good. And if you want to call in, if you're one of the people that has the Skype account, go ahead and you got to hit the phone the phone one, okay, if you want to call in. Don't hit the video one. It's going it, to, it's, I just don't want to do video. I'm not going to answer it if it's video. Uh, because I tried video one time and people took advantage of that and it didn't work out. So uh, if you want to call in, you absolutely can. Let's check out some more stuff. Cats. I know a lot of people just went nuts because some people just love cats, right? Well, I've never even, I, I honestly, I was never into cats that much because I never really looked at it and I, I'm a dog person. So I never really looked into it. But hey, when I was studying um, theory entropy, I came across cats and uh, it, it's something I actually want to go take Jenny and go go see the, the actual show, the Broadway musical Cats. This is a really interesting musical, okay, or play, or whatever you want to call it. Basically, it's a musical. And there are these human-like cat people. I don't know a bunch about the story, but I do know from what I gather, at the beginning, they're all waiting for this, uh, I just forgot the name of it. What is it called to help me out? The jelly, the jelly, jelly something. Jellical, the jellical ball. I think it's called jellical ball, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So they're all making a big deal about this jellical ball and there's going to be a jellical moon. And they're basically like people who are turning into cats. And this whole jellical situation is a big deal because the leader of the cats, Deuteronomy, interesting choice of names for people, right? Or for cats. Uh, Deuteronomy is holding this special event and he's going to choose one of the cats who's going to like go up into the sky and go through a transformation. They're literally going to change, right? Um, and the concept of physical, literal transformation has come up a lot in my studies, especially when going over like Ovid's metamorphosis. There's a lot of uh, people changing into animals in, in that particular uh, work. <laughs> I mean, it's in the name, metamorphosis, right? To change, to change from one form into another form. Well, these people are basically, I have not seen this, but I'm guessing this has everything to do with the plasma apocalypse. That's pure guessing on my part, but it's it seems like this jellical ball has something to do with the plasma apocalypse. I have to do more studying on cats. I so let's let's move on. Okay, so actually we're not going to move on. So, in cats, let me get back here. Let's see here. All right, so I looked up the word jellical. I'm like, what the hell? I've never heard the word jellical. Like it sounds like angelical or it sounds like jelly or jelly-ish, which is really interesting to me because the word jelly is also directly related to the root for the word plasma in the original language. Also, that's where we get the word plastic, this sort of malleable substance that can spread out, which is interesting too because that's exactly how the heavens are described when you uh, translate the book of Genesis and the making of the sky, it translates into something that was hammered out or spread out above us. And the word plasma literally means something that can be spread out or malleable or something that can be shaped, right? Just like plastic. That's why it starts with plas, plasma, plastic, same thing, right? So jellical, let's check this out because I believe the jelly thing is actually really important. I'm going to be researching that next. I'm going to look into slime and jelly and all this stuff and how it's related to plasma. But I want to read this out. So I typed in, is jellical a word? Google, right? And uh, I'll get right to you, Britt. Um, it says, as it turns out, jellical is a strange contorted contraction of the words dear little just as pollicle in pollicle dogs is a contorted contraction of poor little. I don't know about that. It doesn't sound, that could be true, but it doesn't, 
something sounds off about that. It says these words originally came from a little niece of the poet when she tried to say the actual phrases. So what this is talking about is uh, the word jellical from cats and a lot of the stuff in cats apparently came from, uh, what was it, uh, T.S. Lewis? Is that what his name is? Something like that. You could correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, a famous poet basically. And I looked up the poem from where they got this word jellical. This is just a piece of the poem right here. So let me read this to you, okay? Hold on, let me move this actually. One sec. All right, let's go to slideshow. Let me unlock that so I can move it. There we go. All right, so this is from line, uh, the second paragraph in this poem. Lines to a Yorkshire Terrier. This is a really interesting poem. It says, in a brown field stood a tree, and the tree was crooked and dry. In the black sky from a green cloud, natural forces shrieked aloud. Time out. This is describing Plasma Apocalypse. Okay, like that's what I'm getting at so far, right? In a black sky. And we talked about how the black sky is just the underneath portion of our world's roof or dome or ceiling. And that's why it's black, right? It's keeping out all of the light that is actually in space or the heavens or heaven itself. Um, and that's why it's black down here. That's also why in the uh, song Black Hole Sun... He says, uh, neat the black, the sky looks dead, right? And as soon as he says, beneath the black, the sky looks dead. Why is he saying that? I know this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's actually really important because sometimes I pick up on stuff and I forget to share it. <laughs> so I want to share this right now in the song, black hole sun, which is all about the plasma apocalypse. He says beneath the black, the sky looks dead. Well, what is he talking about? He's saying that. The sky should look alive. The sky should have light. It, sh it should have energy and life to it when we look up there, even at the quote unquote nighttime, right? Uh, but it's not. So immediately after he talks about the black uh, uh, sky looking dead, he says, call my name through the cream and I'll hear you scream. I don't want to like sing it too well because I'll make, you know, copyrights and all that. But he says, call my name through the cream. Immediately after talking about the sky looking black and dead, he says to call my name through the cream. And remember what cream was in reference to? It's in reference to space. It's in reference to heaven, which is white, which is pearlescent and opalescent. And that's why you have the pearly gates and all that stuff. That's why the phantasoids and those extraterrestrial beings or whatever you want to call them are typically described as being very um, albino looking, like very white, not Caucasian, but white, right? It says, call my name through the cream and I'll hear you scream again. Anyways, I did think of that. So let's, let's go back to this poem here. Uh, natural forces shrieked aloud, screamed, rattled, muttered endlessly. Wait a minute. So let's, let's break down what he's talking about. He's talking about a field and there's a tree. The tree was crooked and dry in a black sky from a green cloud. Well, green clouds aren't really something we see quite often, right? Unless there's like about to be a tornado or something natural forces shrieked aloud that means that something's happening with the weather so that it's shrieking screaming rattling muttering endlessly right it almost sounds like the sky itself is the voice of god in this particular poem how he's describing it which is exactly how uh, chris cornell describes it in his song black hole sun he talks about how the sky or or uh, the plasma apocalypse that's that's happening the hole in the sky basically is literally sounds like it's singing or talking or something, right? This could be the voice of God. And I do know from religious studies back when I was more of a religious person that the name of God or how people think it's pronounced from one variation to another, it's thought to have been an actual sound that came from the earth itself. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah. Hey, by the way, if you're a moderator, remember to put some links in the chat. You see Mother Dragon just dropped a link in there. If you're a mod and you want to put some links into some relevant stuff, I say go for it. All right. So let's keep, let's keep going. He says, little dog was safe and warm under a criton either down. Yet the field was cracked and brown and the tree was cramped and dry. Pollicle dogs and cats all must. Jellicle cats and dogs all must. Like undertakers come to dust. Like undertakers come to dust. Here a little dog I pause, heaving up my prior paws. Pause and sleep endlessly. 
That's really interesting to me. And that's that's the poem that we're, where we get a lot of the stuff from cats, especially the jellical ball and whatnot. Seems to me like the poem or the poet was talking about the plasma apocalypse, right? These are probably things that have been known about. All right, so we talked about Beast. We talked about uh, the X-Men. We talked about Beauty and the Beast, right? Let me skip ahead. I want to get to the next one in line here. Let's talk about Nebuchadnezzar. Where is he? I know I got a picture of him in here somewhere. Don't worry, we're gonna get we're gonna go over all this stuff. All right, so here's Nebuchadnezzar. Now, biblically speaking, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm not gonna read the whole story to you, okay? Because, you know, it's widely available on the internet or in the Bible or wherever you want. But basically, in short, Nebuchadnezzar is this character in the Bible who was a world leader of sorts, and he thought too much of himself. He thought he was, you know. Some, somebody that could never lose anything, he was only going to win. He was only going to gain and gain and get more things and conquer and dominate. He was not basically a very loving person as described. So God in the Bible basically says, cool, you think you're the best thing since sliced bread? I'm going to turn you into an animal and take your kingdom away from you. Now, it doesn't literally say that he turns him into an animal per se in the Bible, but the way it goes about describing it, okay, it sounds like he was changed into an animal, uh, which is really interesting as well. And the, the way that it talks about Nebuchadnezzar is my assumption of what it's going to be like for many of you out there when you survive the plasma apocalypse. Basically, you're going to go from living in the time of the gods where we live right now, the time of technology, the time of comforts, and you know the time of all this stuff that we have, to caveman type lifestyle, basically. Like eating grass off of the ground because we're not, we don't, we don't understand how to survive without all of our modern comforts, right? So that's the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And I did want to share that. I don't think I have another one. Oh, I can't wait to get to that part. All right, hold on. Let's see. Where are we next? Werewolves. All right, let's talk about werewolves real quick. Where are the, my werewolves? Let's find some werewolves here. All right, so we all know what werewolves are. They're basically, it's a disease technically, right? Um, in fiction, it's a disease. I was probably, I was probably one click away from a werewolf and I went backwards. <laughs> All right, let's check this out. Oh, we'll get to Brundlefly. We'll get to him. We'll get to Superman. We'll get to Conan. We'll get to Pinocchio. We'll get to Master Splinter. Dude, where are the, there, I swore I had a picture of a werewolf. All right, well, Michael Jackson's going to have to do. All right, so anyhow. Uh, lycanthropy is basically what you call the disease of uh, becoming a werewolf. Or if you if you catch this disease, you can become a werewolf, right? And this is known across time. It, this is just as much a part of our history as vampires are, okay? Vampires, like I talk about all of the time, are real. They're a very real part of our society. It's a cartoonified, caricaturized kind of a version of historical fact, Okay just like the elves and just like the other things that I talk about, but werewolves go hand in hand. How can we dismiss werewolves, right? And I'm not talking about people that are born and they have like some extra hair on their face. I've seen those pictures. No, I'm talking about people, human beings that turn into animals, okay? Yes, there are many examples, lots of examples that only support this case of people that have, you know, animal parts, animal hair, animal, whatever it may be. Like they, some people, it's happened. There are these anomalies where people have these certain animal characteristics, right? Uh, when they're born. So werewolves are no uh, exception. Now check this out. The interesting thing about becoming a werewolf is when I was researching Native American history or mythology, however you want to call it, right? I came across something, which I'm going to have to find again. So I'm going to go through these pictures again. Uh, let's see here. Is that it? No. Oh, hey, Pollicle. I should probably read that. I'll read that next. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that Pollicle thing. All right. I'm sorry these are out of order, but hey, at least we get to see a bunch of cool pictures over and over. All right. So let's see. We're talking about the werewolves, and there's something, I think it was on Wikipedia, I wanted to share. Did I already go through this? Oh, here it is. Okay. So, all right. So let me scooch this over a little bit so you can all see it. Now let's read it together. This is Native American legend. Okay. It says, now after all the people had arrived from the lower worlds, first man and first woman placed the, uh, the mountain lion. One second. Let me read that again. Now, after all the people had arrived from the lower worlds, first man and first woman placed the mountain lion 
on one side and the wolf on the other side. So this is talking about the beginning of time or the rebirth of civilization after these uh, catastrophic events had happened to, to the earth, basically, right? So they, in, in a lot of Native American lore, uh, the people continuously keep going up to new worlds. Uh, usually there's some sort of beanstalk or some sort of reed or something that grows up from the center of the earth, which is, like we've talked about, that's that bluish white light that shoots up... Um, and goes into these other realms, basically. Um, but in Native American folklore, these people continuously come up into a newer world, up into another world, up into another world. So this is after all the people had arrived from the lower worlds. It says, first man and first woman placed the mountain lion on one side and the wolf, like we're talking about werewolves, right? Placed the wolf on the other. They divided the people into two groups. The first group chose the wolf for their chief. The mountain lion was the chief for the other side. The people who had the mountain lion chief uh, turned were to be the people of the earth. The people who had the wolf chief became the animals. I know a lot of people are going to say like, hmm, what does that mean to you? Hmm, what does that, you know, to me, that's kind of symbolic for the inner, the, the lower this and that of man. Hey, it could be. You know what else it could be? It could be literally people turned into animals, right? Jeff Roy is in the chat. He says, Jay Dreamer, so happy to catch you live. Never stop what you're doing. Hey, man, I appreciate that. That was really kind. Touche is also in the chat. Says, Cloud Atlas film goes through reincarnation and what our world looks like during these times. Soylent Green references too. Very nice. All right, so let me get back to my notes here. We talked about Beast, the X-Men, Nebuchadnezzar, werewolves. As a matter of fact, just were any animal, okay? Where, where rats, where wolves, okay? It basically applies to all of those uh, words that have the word where in front of them, right? All right, now let me get to something that's really interesting. Let's see if I can find this picture. Wow, it was the very next one. What are the odds of that? That's great. So this was a movie, a weird movie. How many people in the chat saw this movie? Hey, what's up, Rue? Hey, Rue's got the uh, Rue's got the the strong yellow circle in her uh, loyalty badge too. Congrats. That's awesome. It's good to see you guys. So I don't know if you've seen this movie, but it's got Colin Farrell. Time out. Time out. Wait a minute. Do I have... I don't have any of that right now, but I'm just going to... I don't want to keep this picture up there because it's really bright. So let me just talk about the movie first, okay? It says, if I end up alone, I'll be a lobster. This movie is literally about Colin Farrell living in this world during this time when... Basically, the the black sheep, the outcasts, the people who could not find a human mate were turned into animals somehow. I don't know. It doesn't really describe it in the movie um, in very good detail, but they get turned into animals. And this guy wants to turn into a lobster, which I thought was an interesting choice, given that lobsters are probably uh, the ancient uh, remnants of certain types of phantozoids that just shrank and became accustomed to a smaller environment, right? Which is why I'm not a big fan of eating them because eating phantozoid just sounds gross to me. I don't know. That's just me though. All right. So he, he wants to turn into a lobster. This says lobsters live to be over 100 years old, have blue blood just like aristocrats, and stay fertile all of their lives. Hashtag the lobster. Well, in this movie... That's what they do with the rejects. They change them into animals. It's sort of a form of punishment. It's sort of like forced karma in the movie. So I thought that was pretty interesting, right? Um, that's what the whole movie is about. And it's the weirdest movie. And those weird movies are often my favorite movies. Those movies that are just difficult to figure out, like, what is this even about? Like, where did they come up with this? Those movies I found contain the best breadcrumbs for me on my path. All right, so I wanted to share... Oh, yeah, Colin Farrell is the star in the movie, right? So I looked up the word Farrell, and Farrell... Did I... Did I, uh, I think I have a picture. I think I screenshotted Farrell. Let me see if I can find that here. Boom, 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 boom. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Where the heck did I put it? You know what? I know something easier. I should just pull up... A list of my files that way I could just see where it is. All right, let's go back to Pollicle real quick, right? Remember that was in that poem that they used in cats? Uh, they were talking about the Pollicle dogs and the Jellicle cats. Okay, so Jellicle to me, jelly 
to me, the word jellical is not a made up word. Okay. It could be, but if, if I'm correct, if my intuition is and my spidey senses are right, uh, it just means jelly ish or like jelly and jelly is directly related to the root for plasma or plastic, etc. Same thing, right? So they are literally the plasma cats basically, or the plats, the cats of plasma or from plasma, right? Could be interpreted in different ways. The pollicle dog is from that same poem. It says the pollicle dog is who is a stray and wilder than pets. In cats, the jellicles put on a small play when their leader, old Deuteronomy, arrives. Okay, well, forget about that second part. Pollicle, according to this, remember, remember, it's pretty much a made-up word, is a stray dog and more wild than a pet. Well, you guess what feral means? Like Colin Farrell, who was in that movie The Lobster, about being changed into an animal, right? Feral literally means a wild animal, not a t like like in direct opposition to a pet or a tame animal. I thought I had a picture of. I thought I screenshotted it. Let's find out. I don't want to flip through all the pictures for this whole live stream, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna bring up my file. That's what I'm gonna do. Let's bring up the file. People turning into animals file in the plasma apocalypse. All right. Did I take a picture of Pharaoh? Let me turn these into large icons or extra large icons. All right. That's not it. Let's just see if I have it here. Oh, Cersei. We're going to talk about Cersei. Pharaoh, I do have it. Okay, cool. Well, let's just open that up. Boom. That's much easier. Can you guys see that? No, you can't because I opened up a second window. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we're not going to do that then. All right, one second. Let's see. Where is it? It is right next to the Emperor's New Groove and Michael Jackson. All right, let's just look for that. <laughs> oh, you know what? I know. I'm sorry. I know a way easier way of doing this. Okay, cool. Let's just do that, and then we'll do. Where to go? One second. One second. Extra large icons. There we go. Sorry. When there's a lot of stuff on the computer, you get like sort of blind to the thing you're actually looking for. There it is, Farrell. All right, cool. Thank you. So Colin Farrell was in the movie where he turned, he was afraid of changing into an animal, right? He wanted to remain human or he just wanted to straight up turn into a lobster. Farrell. And uh, let me just move this up so you guys can see it here. A feral animal or plant is one that lives in the wild, but is descended from and domest uh, from a domesticated specimen. Specifically, that's the name of feral, like Colin Farrell or Will feral who happens to be a huge animal lover and usually actually has uh, a lot of animals in uh, having to do with his parts in the movies sometimes like in that soccer movie he was in he was actually wearing stripes like he was an animal there's a lot of interesting connections there for me personally but feral literally means not just a wild animal but one that has descended from a domesticated animal right just like we will go from being domesticated in the time of the gods to the plasma apocalypse ripping through our world and forcing everyone back into living off of the land where we, we will be wild once more, right? Brick totally got it right. Hey, by the way, did anybody get the quote? I want to know if somebody got the quote. I put a quote into the description. Would you like a closer look? Does anyone know what movie that's from? I'm just curious because if you are, if you know what it's from, you're automatically a cool person in my book. You guys are all cool people, but that's extra cool. All right, while I wait for an answer... Let me, uh, I'm going to check the cat. I'm going to check the chat too. I'm going to check the cat. Oh, there's all these like cat things going on here. And there's something about cats, isn't there? Okay, the next one I want to share is Electric Dreams. There is this show on Amazon called Electric Dreams. And it's very much like uh, Black Mirror, right? Remember that show Black Mirror on Netflix? One of my favorite uh, series ever. Philip K. Dick who wrote a lot of esoteric stuff. He's the one who did this uh, Electric Dreams. Now, that's also an interesting title, Electric. What does electricity have to do with all of these strange, seemingly unconnected stories that are in this particular series, right? And and why call it Electric Dreams? I think it's all very esoteric, which it usually is, right? <laughs> Uh, to the esoteric, all things are esoteric, and I myself am an enigma. I'm esoteric. Anyhow, so this is a clip from the show. Basically, there's this, there's this world, 
Okay, it's basically our world is what I'm saying, where these people have changed into these uh, like chimera or chimera. Right. Uh, This lady right here is clearly part human, part pig. Here's another clip from the same thing. Right now, the the deal about this in in the movie is that and and this also happens a lot with the chimera or with uh, animal hybrids is they don't typically have long lifespans and it's generally hard for them to reproduce typically from my studies and my research. I could be wrong, but that's what I found so far. Now in the show, in uh, Electric Dreams, this particular episode is called, if you want to look it up, it's called Crazy Diamond. And all these episodes are really good. Okay. It's a really great series. This one's called Crazy Diamond. And one of the things about these people who, who are half human, half animal is that they don't have very long lifespans. They have really short lifespans. So it's an interesting thing, but the, yeah, they turn these people into animals, right? Oh, let's see. Did anybody get the quote? Blade Runner? Pfft, no, it's not Blade Runner. Actually, I'm sorry. Let me be fair. The quote is, would you like a closer look? That's probably in hundreds of movies. <laughs> uh, you have to guess the movie I'm thinking of, okay? So yes, there are probably many correct answers, but there's only one right one. Oh, uh, Vegan Demon says, would mermaids relate to this topic? Yeah, of course they could, right? They could totally relate to this topic. Now, mermaids could be two things. It could be uh, an anthropomorphism of the ancient gods, and they just depicted them as being fish because they were already kind of scaly and shiny looking, and they typically came up from the water. Or, hey, if we're going to say that people can turn into animals and vice versa, we're we're we're... We're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? We're going to keep that in. I'm going to keep that in my mind as a definite possibility. Uh, nobody got it. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what movie it's from. No, I won't. Remind me at the end. I'll give everybody more time. Hey, um, I also want to throw out there, you can call in, okay? If, if you are on the circuits of time, you, I've got my Skype open right now. I believe I fixed everything. I have not done a live call yet, but you can call in and uh, just go ahead and get grab my uh, Skype account from the community tab and you can call in and talk for me for a little bit if you want to. I just want to throw that out there and remind people that we're doing calls now. All right. So let me go back to my notes. So we talked about two good movie examples of people turning into animals, right? And I mean, I'm not talking about like movie examples where it's portrayed as being fictitious, but it's portrayed as being very real, normal, and and an accepted part of life. And that was The Lobster with Colin Farrell and uh, Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams and the episode called Crazy Diamond. Now, the next one I want to talk about is a play. Let me see if I could find... Hold on. I don't need to find it. I just go right to it. I forgot. All right. The next one is called Rhinoceros. And it's a play a while back. It's an older play. Here's a little uh, advert for it. Okay. Now, this this play was by Eugene Lanesco. It's called Rhinoceros, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sum it up. I'm gonna sum it up real quick. Basically, there's this uh, guy in this town, okay, and over the course of time, uh, this guy this guy's an alcoholic. He's got issues. He's he's trying not to accept his inner being and his true self and stuff. And he's got issues with the world around him. So he just drinks a lot, basically, and he just tries to forget about life and he doesn't want to deal with it. Well, life comes at him and makes him deal with it in the form of the people in the town all transforming into rhinoceroses, rhinoceri, rhino, rhinoceroses. I don't know. Anyways, they all turn into animals basically, right? Uh, one by one, slowly over time. And the rest of the town's folks start going, oh my God, it turned into an animal. Oh my God, it turned into a rhinoceros. And he doesn't believe it. Like he doesn't want to believe it because over the course of time, people basically try to convince him that he is also a rhinoceros, right? And the, the you question over, when you watch this play, you're basically saying, hmm, is he, is the rest of the town all humans and they have a mental condition? Or does he have a mental condition and the rest of the town literally is turning into animals and he does not want to accept this fact? Which at the end, I believe he ends up accepting the fact that he is a rhinoceros, right? Um, but why, why would he be a rhinoceros who is thinking like a human? Why would he be a rhinoceros that is thinking like, I'm not a rhinoceros, I'm a human being. If 
he had recently changed into an animal or is going through the process of uh, therianthropy, then yeah, it makes sense to me that he would start questioning his own identity when he's physically starting to change into something else and he would have a lot of problems with that. Now, I, want to also, I also want to point this out too. I have an animal. Her name is Delilah. She is a part of my family. And when I, man, the more time I spend with her and many other animals as well, the less animal I see and the more person I see. And some of you animal lovers out there know exactly what I'm talking about. You start to see and connect with your animal as its own person, right? Like, like, like you can almost see a human behind those eyes. And that's, that's some of the most compelling evidence to me that has nothing to do with proof or evidence or, you know, studies or research or any of that. It's just, it's this feeling you get when you look into their eyes and they are literally communicating emotion. Uh, they're, they're telling you things, they're sharing things with you or with me, I should say. All right, let's see here. Remember, if you want my attention, just type in at jdreamers or if you're uh, a member of the Circuits of Time, you can just call in using Skype at any time. All right, so let's go on to the next one here on my list. We talked about werewolves. We talked about the movie Lobster, Electric Dreams, the rhinoceros. Was he actually a rhino who could not come to terms with being a rhino? Let's talk about centaurs, right? These types of things permeate our world, our stories, right? The centaurs are no exception. A lot of people would just say, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's not real. Centaurs is just made up. It's just complete fiction and utter fabrication. I don't believe anything is complete fiction. I don't believe anything is utter fabrication or total lies. I believe that truth makes everything and therefore everything is made out of the truth, but it falls to us to unravel it. It falls to us to make sense of it. There are no contradictions in life, but everything can be reconciled. Even centaurs, right? Uh, part men, part horse. This is I don't know where this clip came from. I pulled this off the internet. But we've seen the centaurs talked about in all of our mythology, right? Um, and here's the thing, right? If we are able to be open-minded enough to accept a lot of fringe topics and a lot of strange ideas because of comparative mythology, shouldn't we be open to at least considering all of it throughout all of mythology? People turning into animals, animal per people, I should say animal human hybrids, because animals are people too, but animal human hybrids are a staple of our past. They're a staple of our myths and our legends, right? They've, they've always been there. Uh, this one, oh, actually, I'm sorry. That one is, is actually, uh, the minotaur minotaur and, uh, tor comes from the word Taurus, which you know, in the animal world is the bull, the tor, right? Just like the sign Taurus is a bull, right? There's also the Taurus field and that gets really deep. Uh, Santos Bonacci on YouTube can explain that all day long to you. Uh, but we're not going to talk about Taurus fields right now. We're going to talk about crazy people turning into animals and stuff, which I just love. But anyhow, this is the minotaur or, or the bull of Minos or Minot, right? Um, or it could actually, if you break down Minotaur, it could be man and, or man of bull, man of, uh, man, man of the bull or something along those lines, because men could also be man or mon, right? All right. So let's see here. So we got the Minotaur, we got the Centaurs. Let me stop with Centaurs real quick. Let me actually, let me find a cool picture to stop on. This one's okay. I really like the Ghostbusters one. I'm going to go back to that one. That's probably my favorite one. Plus, it matches everything that I did back here. So, All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm not going to screen share, but I'm going to read something from the book of Joshua, okay? What is the book of Joshua? What are you guys talking about in the chat? Percy Jackson movies, Narnia. I love this chat. I wish I was in it right now. Mortal Kombat. Oh, man. Okay, I'm definitely going to re read the chat later on. Um... Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about the book of Joshua. I have talked about this particular thing before in the past. If you don't know what the book of Joshua is, it is one of those ancient books that was left out of the Bible, as they say, okay? Um, actually, it was not completely left out of the Bible because the Bible quotes the book of Joshua. I believe the book of Samuel, like the whole first chapter, 
is a direct quote from the book of Joshua, all right? Um, also, the book of Joshua is where it talks about the sun stopping in the sky for like a day or an extended period of time. So the book of Joshua is just, it's a parallel book to the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus and uh, Joshua as well. So the book of Joshua to me is right up there with the book of Enoch. It's right up there with the book of Jubilees and a whole handful of other ones that were left out of the Bible. Okay. I don't know if it was left out or whatever, but it used to be considered a uh, sacred, truthful, holy text basically. Okay. So I'm going to read from the book of Joshua and this is a parallel tell from the book of Genesis. Now it says, hold on. Why is this so white? It's too bright. Anyway, I'll just read it. It says the sons of Shobal. So this is giving you the genealogy of somebody's family. The sons of Shobal. And you, you know what? Let me stop right there. For those of you who are doing biblical studies or studies in, in any type of religion and you get to the part in your in your books where they're listing off names and you get really bored with hearing so-and-so beget so-and-so, so-and-so beget so-and-so, stick with that. That's my advice to you. And find the gems, find the hidden treasures in that because they're not just listing off these names for no reason. Sometimes you find a little gem in there and it doesn't go into great detail about it because it was such a commonly known story at the time that this was written that they didn't feel any need to go into it. Or there was another manuscript that was written that did go into detail about this. Now, this is exactly what it says in the Bible. In the Bible, it's got the same exact family lineage that I'm about to read to you, but then it has this little breadcrumb. This little gem that it throws out and it says, this is the so-and-so who found the Yamim in the wilderness. And that's all it says in the Bible. But thankfully, we've got the book of Joshua that goes on and corroborates the story. It goes on and uh, gives more information about what, wait, 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 what was that? What was that? Right? The book of Joshua says, hey, here's what that was about. And let me read you the story. The sons of Shobal. I feel like my volume's too loud. Is my volume good? I think. I'm just going to turn it. Uh, it's probably good. I'm going to leave it alone. The sons of Shobal were Alvin, Manahath, Abal, Shepho, Onam, and the sons of Zibion were Aja, Ana, and this actually is probably Anach. This was the Anach who found the Yamim in the wilderness when he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. Asses means donkeys, okay? And whilst he was feeding his father's asses, he led them to the wilderness at different times to feed them. This is where it gets weird. And there was a day that he brought them to one of the deserts on the seashore, opposite of the wilderness of the people. And whilst he was feeding them, behold, a very heavy storm came from the other side of the sea and rested upon the asses that were feeding there. And they all stood still. And afterward, about 120 great and terrible animals came out from the wilderness at the other side of the sea, and they all came to the place where the asses were, and they placed themselves there. And those animals, from their middle downward, were in the shape of the children of men. And from the middle upward, some had the likeness of bears, some the likeness of kifas, with tails behind them from between their shoulders, reaching down to the earth like the tails of the dikupat. And these animals came and mounted and rode upon these asses and led them away, and they went away unto this day. And one of these animals approached Anak and smote him with his tail, and then fled from that place. <laughs> And when he saw this work, Anak was exceedingly afraid of his life, and he fled and escaped the city. And he related this story to his sons and brothers, all that happened to him. And many men went out to seek the asses, but could not find them. And Anak and his brothers went no more to that place from that day following, for they were greatly afraid for their lives. If you want to find this particular interesting story... I recommend the entire book. The entire book is full of little tidbits like this, where the Bible tends to leave some things out. Uh, let's see. I believe this is... Let me see if I can try to find it here. Oh, that's uh, Joshua chapter 33, interestingly enough. 
So in chapter 33 of the book of Joshua, you can read the same story about this Hebrew kid who goes out to sort of let his donkeys uh, graze on the grass or whatever. And there are literally these uh, chimera or chimera that come in, jump on his donkeys, ride them off into the wilderness, steal his stuff. And then one of them kind of slaps him with his tail upside the face or whatever. Interesting story, man. Uh, I can see why that was not included in the Bible, but... Oh, hey, Unlearn the System says an ass is a donkey cross mule. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Things that make you go, hmm, says Samyaza. Beast Wars Transformers by Vru. Okay. Uh, Vegan Demon is in the chat and says, J-Germers, how about the four-faced angels with the ox, eagle, lion, and human? Uh, that also could be another example. That's another good example of that too. I haven't looked into that one in particular, so I can't speak on it a lot, but I see where you're going with that. Okay, so let's check out my notes real quick. Let me get back over here. So that was the book of Joshua, which literally talks about there having been physical uh, human animal hybrids that stole this guy's flock of donkeys and took off. Uh, there are different translations uh, that make it sound a little different as far as this storm that arrived, but there was this storm that came out of nowhere, rested upon this guy's area, and then the storm kind of went away along with these uh, chimera. All right, so let's talk about something else. I want to get to, let me see, let me find it here. Let's see. Next, we're going to talk about Pinocchio. Okay, so this is an interesting story, okay? All of this story is true. All of this story is about us and things that we have gone through in our history's timeline. That history has been obliterated. It now falls under the category that I placed it in called ancient oblivion. Um... And it falls to us to sort of piece it together. To me, all of the movies are our lives reflected back to us. They are all truths that we have gone through and they're all being reflected back to us. So Pinocchio is the story of this inanimate object that becomes animate when the blue fairy appears. Let's stop right there. I'm going to break it down, okay? During the plasma apocalypse, right now, all of the energy and light is flowing downwards towards us from above, okay? Okay. We're going to go through a pole shift or a polar shift or a polarity shift when that light will no longer, that energy will not be traveling downwards. It will, it'll hit neutral and it'll flip and it'll go upwards, which means light literally will go up instead of down. It'll come in from all sides of the sky. Our whole world will be lit up. You won't be, trust me, you're not going to be in the dark or anything. You'll be, you'll actually see everything much better when that happens. But when that happens, in the middle of our world, you can check on the old maps and uh, look, you know, type up uh, North Pole, old maps. You can clearly see there was land up there. In the middle of that land, there is this sort of volcano black mountain. Okay, it goes by many names. Mount Maru is probably the best one because that means mountain of the ocean. Literally, it's an island mountain, right? Just like in Moana. When Moana and uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, the demigod. I don't know why I forget stuff like this when I'm live streaming. Moana and what's that guy's name? Help me out. What was that guy's name? The big guy played by the rock. I totally forgot. Moana and I, I'm not going to continue until I figure out this dude's name. Cause it's like right here. It's on tip of my tongue. Uh, hold on. Let me look at it. Oh, I, I keep wanting to say Rafiki, but that's not his name. <laughs> All right, forget it. Somebody in the chat will tell me. Anyway, so let's get back to Maui. Oh, thank you. Okay, Maui, yes. Thank you, Brit. I appreciate it. So Moana and Maui go to this uh, mountain island, right? And it's basically hollow. It's a, like a volcano. They jump inside of it, and that's how they enter into these other worlds. Well, I believe that's exactly what exists in our world. It was called Mount Maru. It goes by many names, but in the middle, basically, it's not a lava-filled volcano, but it is a conduit for the energy or the plasma when the plasma does not come down, but it reverses and comes up from underneath our world. It comes up through and around our world going upwards, which means it will shoot up this baby blue, whitish, brilliant light of plasma in a huge beanstalk, in a huge uh, Jacob's Ladder. I mean, it's been described in so many different ways. From the middle of our world, that's going to shoot straight up into the sky. And um, 
at the same time, also, remember I said there's this electromagnetic force field wrapped around our world, keeping the plasma right now from coming down into our world. Well, think about this. If the plasma is coming up from the middle of the world and that force field goes back up and the force field repels plasma, it's not going to leave. It's actually going to fill up our world with electromagnetic energy or plasma. And that is the blue fairy. That is the blue fairy that gives life to the inanimate objects of the world because it's filling it up with spirit, AKA plasma. So Pinocchio is the story of this inanimate object that all of a sudden becomes animate because that's what's going to happen during the plasma apocalypse and probably afterwards the electronics. I totally spat on my monitor, dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited right now. The electronics of our world are go all going to come to life, probably along with many other inanimate things, okay? And that's why you get things like Toy Story, Total Recall, uh, I mean, not Total Recall, Terminator, all these movies where you have these inanimate objects coming to life. Um, I even did a movie breakdown. What was that movie I broke down about the semi-trucks and they all come to life? Maximum overdrive, right? Um, that's exactly what's happening. That's a part of the plasma apocalypse. So that's what we're seeing with Pinocchio. Inanimate object, toy basically, just like in Toy Story, coming to life. Now he's not fully human though. So he tries to go on this uh, self-identification quest of becoming human. But check this out. There's a point in the story in which Pinocchio, right... He goes off to the island of misfit children. Basically, there's all these people there, these humans, right? They're already human and they are bad. They're portrayed as being like immoral, basically. I mean, I'm not going to judge the things they were doing. You know, I'm not going to say if you smoke cigars and drink beer, you're going to turn into an animal. But what I'm saying, these things are symbolic for what's happening to them. That's how they're being portrayed by the people who made the, bo the movies or wrote the books, right? And a lot of people forget that this even happened in Pinocchio. Okay. A lot of people remember Pinocchio was a puppet. He wanted to be a real boy. There was a whale, there was a cricket, but they forget Pinocchio literally turned into a donkey or started to turn into a donkey. And they forget about the Island of Misfit Kids or just like they had on Toy Story, the Misfit Toys or whatever, right? Uh, they turned into animals as a sort of punishment for their lower vibration, their lower frequency that they were on. They were changed into lower forms of life. I say that loosely, okay? Because I don't, I don't believe in lower forms of life, okay? But uh, everything has levels to it, okay? So that's what I'm saying. Pinocchio basically is tempted to stop, to stray off of his path of righteousness, to stray off of his path of self-identification and finding himself and getting to know himself and wanting to be the best he can be. And he gets distracted by these people who are like, uh, I thought I had another picture of that other kid. I bet I do. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. There's like this bully. I don't know if he's a bully. He's just a, this cool guy in the movie. And uh, he starts turning into a donkey first. And Pinocchio sees it happening. And he starts freaking out. Like, oh my god, this place sucks. Get me out of here before it's too late. All right, I don't think I, I, don't think I have that one. But anyway, uh, Pinocchio is a classic example of all of this. Let me go back to my notes here. And let's see, we talked about Pinocchio and turning into the donkey, right? So that, that was his choice. He could have turned into a human or an animal, just like the ancient um, tribal stories that we went over already talked about. Um, on one side was placed the wolf. The people that followed the wolf turned into animals. They turned into the animals of the world. The people that followed the lion turned into the humans. Same story in Pinocchio. We already talked about Brother Bear. Let's talk about one of my favorite cartoon movies ever. Let me see uh, where it is. It's probably the funniest cartoon movie ever that I've ever seen. And that is... Where is it? Well, that's weird. I don't seem to have it. Let me see if I... Let me click on all files and see if it brings it up. Wow, it's not in here. I swear, I, I, I totally thought that I had downloaded this particular image. That's weird. I wonder where it went. Anyhow, you know what? I want to I wanna have a picture for you guys. Let me just go ahead and grab one real quick off the internet. It's going to be a surprise. Let's see if you guys can guess which movie I'm about to bring up. All right, so we're just going to take a brief little intermission here while I look up a picture. <laughs> Where is it? Let's see here. Such a funny movie, too. Uh, we'll do this one.
this one, that'll work. All right, cool. Let me save this image, and I'll bring it right up. And we'll save that as image zero so I can find it easier. There it is. Boom. Wait, did that work? It did work. Oh, cool. Check that out. All right, cool. All right, so it's called The Emperor's New Groove, basically, right? And in, the, in this uh, Disney movie, it's about this emperor, just like Nebuchadnezzar, just like all these other people we've been talking about, just like Pinocchio or, or whoever it is. They all started to get very self-righteous or self-involved or selfish in some way, shape, or form, and they were distracted by the very basic and base things of the world. Their, their vibration was off, right? So as a form of punishment, sometimes it's by a witch. In this movie, it's by a, a witch named Isma, which is, this whole movie is freaking hilarious but uh the witch isma she's represented by purple which has a lot to do with the symbolism of the plasma and royalty and things of that nature but it turns emperor Cusco, which they chose his name uh purposefully they chose everything in this movie purposefully turned him into an animal as a form of punishment right and uh you can see it all throughout this movie as well but like pacha this this uh this guy right here played by john goodman Pacha is talking with him like he knows that he's human on the inside. He's not he doesn't immediately just say, oh, psh, you're an animal now. You know, I'll just treat you like an animal. He still treats him like a human being. He still treats him like an equal, which is really interesting because although Emperor Cusco here is clearly an animal, he's still treating Pacha like a lesser form of life, which is really kind of ironic, right? All right. Uh, let's see. Is anybody, anybody? Okay. Brit, Brit says J dreamers end of last year, 1227 blue light in the sky over New York city. I did see that. I saw all of that actually. And it was, it was interesting to see how many people interpreted it in so many different ways. Uh, but yeah, that, that whole New York thing with the light in the sky was really interesting. You're going to see a lot more of that happen in the upcoming years. Okay. You're going to see a lot of really strange phenomena happening in our sky. I promise you this much. Okay. It's going to get, it's going to, it's going to get more and more and more. The weather's going to get more extreme. It's going to get, uh, the seasons are going to last a lot longer, specifically winter and summer. They're just going to get like there's pretty much going to be two seasons, right? Just winter and summer basically. And, uh, it's going to amplify and amplify to the point of bursting at which point, you know, we'll probably have Fimbleventer and then we'll have the plasma apocalypse. Meow kitty. This lady gets turned into a cat. Mermaids. I, I talked about mermaids already. We talked, kind of discussed that as a possibility. You see, here's the thing. If I haven't put a lot of study into it, I don't want to talk about it a lot because, you know, I'm just, I, I don't want to like, I don't want to talk off the top of my head just because I want to support what you guys are saying. I want to have my own good foundation for it first. So we can definitely talk about mermaids another time when I've looked more into mermaids. Uh, but right now we're going to press on with, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't bring up a picture of this guy, but there's a killer croc. He's from the suicide squad. He's basically an animal person too. We did talk about the minotaur. We did talk about the bush of uh, the bush, the, uh, the book of Joshua and the hybrids mentioned therein. Those hybrids, if you want to look them up on Google, they're called the Zemzumim, the Yemim, the Zemzumim. And there was another one. I forgot what it was, but uh, they're basically words for hybrids and hybrids that are giant in stature as well. And then, of course, we've got the ancient depictions of hybrids. So let's finish that one off. Let me go to these ancient depictions here. And we're going to check out some of these ancient. Oh, here's a werewolf one. Man, was... where were all these ones before? Well, this is OK. I might as well just share this one's kind of cool. So this chick is turning into a werewolf. OK. Just total pinup calendar werewolf, which is okay with me. Uh, but here's some more examples of people changing into animals. Now, keep in mind, please keep in mind, just because we accept this is a possibility doesn't mean we should jump to the conclusion this right here is exactly how it looked. This right here is most likely, like all other, th other things have been, this is a caricature. This is a cartoonified um, glorified version of the small bits of truth that passed down to us. Okay. We can reverse engineer these things. Does it happen that fast? Could be. 
I'm going to talk about that when we talk about the brundlefly. Here are some an ancient examples of some animal-human hybrids, okay? Now, people look at these all the time, and they don't seem to question, like, were there actually humans that were part animal or gods, even gods that were part animal, right? They would be susceptible to the plasma as well, right? These ancient Egyptian gods, uh, these ancient Greek gods, many different places. This is literally the original con concept of the chimera or the chimera, chimera. My, actually, let me break down the word chimera real quick, okay? Because I haven't broken it down, so I'm just going to do it on the fly. The first part, chai or chai, right? It's actually more of a guttural chai right? That word literally is where we get chi, like in uh, anime, you know how like they use their chi and they focus it and they throw a fireball or whatever. That's their life. That's their power. And it literally means life. And it's always portrayed in anime and stuff and video games as plasma. Imagine that life when it's actually drawn out is drawn in the form of plasma, right? Chai mera. Mm, I don't know. There's an A at the end, but mer. M-E-R means water or lake or ocean or sea, basically. So we've got life, water, and then ah. The ah is more of a ah, like spirit, basically, breath. So I don't know. I'll, I'll have to break that word down another time, but I was just kind of thinking off the top of my head. I like to do that sometimes, but this is the ancient depiction. What a chimera or chimera represents is a hybrid a mix between different species, basically. It could be human as well, okay? The, the, the chimera or chimera doesn't have to be a lion, a goat, and a dragon or whatever that is with crazy duck dragon feet. But what they're trying to tell you here is it's a mix. It's a hybrid. It's a mix of other things. This is another one here. This lady is like part spider, part person. Could represent the plasma as well because it's often depicted as uh, spider, like grandmother spider. We've talked about that a lot. This is ancient Egypt. Obviously, we've got somebody who's clearly human. They knew what humans looked like, right? And then the god. Now, sometimes they drew the gods as human looking. Sometimes they had green skin. Sometimes they had blue skin. Um, sometimes they had brown skin. But look, they clearly knew the difference between drawing a human being and drawing a non-human being, <laughs> right? So we could look deeper into this and ask what it symbolizes and what it means, but we can also keep an open mind and say it might not symbolize anything except for literally what they saw and experienced. Half animal, half person, gods that were known as shapeshifters anyways, and maybe because of the influx of magic or plasma in our world, it probably amplified some of them or... uh mutated them just like the x-men right we've also got these different depictions of part human part lions and part dogs and part uh like the centaurs and stuff on different parts of the world this exists could it is it only symbolic is it only a metaphor or is there a possibility it could be literal at times not across the board but at times could it have been literal this one is a. Uh, one of the depictions of the old Anunnaki, right? Holding the little acorn pineal gland or whatever that's supposed to be there, right? I love these pictures. They always have these little purses down here. If you look at their, their legs, it looks like they've got something like exoskeleton or some sort of technology down here. You see that on his calf? Like this part is not a natural part of the body, whatever this is. And it seems to be attached to his shoe or his foot or whatever this is. But this is your calf muscle. That's I know what that looks like, right? This thing that sweeps around the, to the front, I don't know what that is. So I'm I'm leaning towards that's uh, something foreign, I'll say. We'll say foreign, but probably some kind of technology that helps to advance their powers or something. And he's got some stuff tucked away right there. This is the stuff that we need to pay more attention to. Instead of just looking at it as a whole and seeing a bird head and a human body, we need to look at the details of these pictures and ask ourselves, what's that right there? What's on his wrist? Why does he have a watch on? What's up with this purse? Why is he holding that? Did he take this out of the purse? You know what I mean? We have to really start reverse engineering these things and breaking them down. Uh, let's see. Did I have anything else I want to talk about? No. Okay, cool. Let me close out my notes and got it. Okay. 
hold on one second. I don't know what just popped up. All right, so we're gonna I'm gonna go over the rest of these images, these pictures. We're still taking calls. If anybody wants to call in, you could totally call in and chat if you want to. I know it's you know not a lot of people are gonna call to start off with, but over time we'll end up getting a lot of callers. So here are some other depictions here. We're just gonna go over all these pictures. We're gonna start with the green monkey. So remember that when we get back to the green monkey, we're gonna be done. All right, so this is green monkey is some sort of a god or deity in Hinduism, right? And we all know in Hinduism, their gods are a plethora of gods. They have different things, gods for everybody, right? But look at this. They have this statue right here with all these different human faces. This guy's a god. He's got the blue face, blue skin. But then we start getting over here, and you've got this sort of Dr. Seuss-looking character, this sort of a uh, Whoville god. This is, like the god. this is like the Hindu god of the Who's. <laughs> But he basically has an animal kind of structure. Next to him, this dude's clearly an animal, right? Maybe, what is this showing us? Is this, I mean, why would they put these two here? The rest of them, okay, they're pretty human looking, right? But boom, we've got two hybrid looking beings here, right? Uh, we already talked about the Emperor's New Groove. Ghostbusters is all about the plasma apocalypse. I love that movie. Oh, it's just classic. Uh, we talked about Beauty and the Beast already, Brother Bear as well, and the natives talking about their own legends, about how people uh, were given the choice to turn into animals or people, right? Well, let's say that we're given that choice, but how it's presented to us is another thing, right? Most people would wait until it's too late and say, no one ever told me I had a choice. No one ever asked me, do I want to be an animal after the plasma apocalypse or do I want to be a human? Uh, you are constantly being asked that every day you wake up throughout your life, right? Like you're basically just going to turn into the animal totem or to the totem that you represent the most. What kind of vibration do you have? What kind of energy do you have? And why does this happen if it happens? My guess is that it happens because of karma, karmic reasons. It has to do with frequency and vibration. It has to do with teaching people lessons. That's why we're all here. We're all here to learn these lessons and go through these experiences. This is just my personal opinion on these things, of course. Uh, cats. I'm definitely going to look more into cats and I'll probably like rent. Oh, actually, I think Jenny has cats. I don't know if Jenny's watching right now, uh, but Jenny has cats. So we're probably going to watch it. We talked about the poem that had the word jellical in it and pollicle. We did talk about the centaurs as well. This whole series right here, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think that's what this is from. This is all true, okay? Like The Lord of the Rings, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, all of these fantastic movies that have these strange beings and whatnot. This is your esoteric past, and this is inevitably going to be <laughs> your future one of these days. All right, let's see what else we got here. Hopi, hey, Hopi's in the chat, says, J Dreamers, did you read Bell and the Dragon? Yes, I have read that. Another text that was removed from the Bible where people were worshiping a dragon and one of the gods, uh, Peeps, goes and kills it with basically a hairball. Yeah, actually, that's a really interesting story. We should break that down sometime. Um, what is that dragon, I wonder? Was that a phantasoid? I often wonder if that was actually a phantasoid. Uh, the centaurs are often depicted. The minotaur is classic. I mean, the minotaur is not just in Greek mythology. It's in all of the myths. It's in all of the legends. They, ha they all have some version of this minotaur who is this sort of strange monster at the middle of the labyrinth in the center of the world where there is magic, right? We know there is an inner earth. Well, I know there's an inner earth. I mean, hey, Circe, I want to talk about this too. So Circe, okay, or Kirke. Kirke, pronounced Kirk or Kirke. So Kirk, just like Captain Kirk, right? Kirk and church and Kirke, okay, however you want to say it. All these words basically mean circle. That's what they all mean, circle. Circus, circular, circumference, circe, Kirke, church. All these words mean circle, right? Ku close, like the Ku, Ku Klux Klan, that means family circle. That's all these words mean circle. So why is this word circle so prominent, right? Circe, I, I call it Circe. I don't like Kirke. A goddess of magic or sometimes a nymph. Enchantress or sorceress in Greek mythology. She is a daughter of the god Helios. 
sun god, and either the oceanid nymph Pierce or goddess Hecate. Circe, Kirke, Kirke, whatever, was renowned for her vast knowledge of potions and herbs, though the use, or I'm sorry, through the use of these and a magic wand, ahem, light blue plasma beam shooting up out of the center of the world, the reed of the ancient Native Americans, the beanstalk of Jack, the ladder of Jacob, right? I'm just putting that out there, okay? The magic wand, right? Uh, through these and the use of her magic wand or staff, she would transform her enemies or those who offended her into animals. The best known of her legends is told in Homer's Odyssey. Okay. Not Homer Simpson. <laughs> Homer's Odyssey, when Odysseus visits her island, so she lives on an island too. Didn't we say that in the middle of our world that there is this island mountain that this beam shoots up out of? Magic wand, island. I'm seeing all the connections right now, right? Uh, let's see here. Where was I? I lost my place. Odysseus visits her island of Aeaea. Like that's an awesome word. A-E-A-E-A. -E -A -E -A. Scrabble players, remember that. Uh, oh, it's a proper noun. You can't. On the way back to uh, from the Trojan War, and she changes most of Odysseus's crew into swine, into pigs, right? So that's an interesting story to me as well. Man, this whole thing is just, it makes so much sense. I think this is the type of thing where either it totally hits you and you're vibing with it, or like maybe a couple things, but you're like, I don't know about that. It's kind of weird sounding. Or you're just lost and you're like, I don't even know what I'm watching right now. Uh, we talked about Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams. There he is. That's what I was looking for earlier. Where can I find that? That's when he's like, hey, Kronk, want to be a pal and top me off? <laughs> I know this whole movie by heart, dude. It's the funniest movie ever. I love it. This is when like, oh, my God, I'm a llama. Llama face. <laughs> he's so he's so upset about being an animal. I wonder if animals like feel like that sometimes. I don't know. I I would oh, I don't know. I'm gonna, I, maybe I should just chat with my animal. We talked about feral. The word feral, Will Feral, Colin Feral, etc. Uh, here's Michael Jackson, who's obviously into the esoteric, right? And he's got this whole deal, wearing his little M M shirt, <laughs> and uh, he turns into a werewolf in Thriller. And the whole movie, uh, the whole concept of Thriller, like Michael Jackson's Thriller, which is. Pfft, the jam. I mean, like I rock out to that all the time. Hey, by the way, speaking of Michael Jackson's thriller, I'm just going to plug myself real quick. I'm on TikTok now. So, um, yeah, I like being goofy. I like having fun. I like making funny, goofy videos and stuff. And I don't get to do that on here a lot because I'm so serious or semi-serious all the time. But, uh, that's one of the things I was doing on TikTok is rocking out to Michael Jackson's thriller in the car. And, uh, it, it's pretty cool. So check it out if you want to. It's uh, You can find me on TikTok by going to jdreamers.youtube. That's my name on there. Uh, check that stuff out if you want to. Anyway, I was rocking out to Thriller. And in Thriller, he bit, he basically turns into this Wolverine. I mean, not Wolverine. This uh, same thing. He turns into this werewolf, right? And there's all these zombies and stuff. And then Vincent Price is in there basically basically narrating the plasma apocalypse as it's happening because zombies are also a part of the plasma apocalypse. This is the coolest event I have ever come across in my life. That's why I love it so much. Now I want to throw this out there for those of you watching, you know who you are. Okay. Lots of people talk about lots of different things from their own perspective, from their own research, from their own intuition or guesses or whatever it may be, their own studies. So this is how I present the plasma apocalypse. Okay. If you like it, if it resonates with you, awesome. Great. That sounds good to me. If it doesn't good vibes and goodbye. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. There are some examples of these strange anomalies out there too. I've seen some of these videos where these animals have some pretty human looking qualities. And I'm not saying all the videos are real. You know, there's always exceptions, but I'm also saying not all of them are fake. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's some interesting combos going on. We talked about the movie The Lobster. I want to read this one one more time. This is the Native American myth or legend. Now, after the people had arrived from the lower worlds, first man and first woman placed 
the mountain lion on one side and the wolf on the other. They divided the people into two groups. The first group chose the wolf for their chief. The mountain lion was the chief for the other side. The people who had the mountain lion chief turned were able... Uh, I'm sorry. The mountain lion... The people who had the mountain lion chief turned were to be the people of the earth. So basically, some people were human and some people were animals. Nebuchadnezzar was basically portrayed as an animal. Somebody who lost his human-like qualities, grew claws and everything, right? Oh, I really wanted to touch on this. I totally forgot about this. Okay, okay. I grew up in like the early 90s, okay, like uh, mid-80s basically when I was a kid and stuff. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was already awesome as a cartoon, okay? I don't. I know some people have issues with it because they break it down, think it's about weird reptilian stuff or whatever. It could be, but I loved Ninja Turtles. And this movie came out and I lost my mind because it was real Ninja Turtles, okay? At the time, it looked pretty dang real. But this one right here in particular, this part two, was called The Secret of the Ooze, this green ooze. And I've just come across this recently because I've been coming across this concept of goo and ooze and slime and how this all relates to life. Actually, the movie Flubber literally just popped into my head just now as I'm talking. But there's something to all of this. And I believe, like I said, the, the root for the word plasma is directly related to the word jelly and uh, the word plastic and probably by extension ooze and slime and some other things. I'm, I'm just thinking off the top of my head right now. But it is this substance, this substance called ooze in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Part 2 that is responsible for the transformation of animals into people type beings or i mean you know it depends on if you're going with the cartoon version the comic book version or the movie version because they're all kind of different um in in the cartoon version it okay let me start with the movie okay in this movie right here you've got this sort of ooze this green slime canister falls down into the sewers where there were this rat and these turtles, okay? And they had most recently been exposed to the DNA of human beings. And because their DNA was the ones that was mixed with uh, the turtles and the rat, they grew into human-like beings or chimera, chimera, right? Um, this is a theme I have started to see lately of the ooze actually being plasma and the introduction and amplification of plasma or spirit or life, whatever you want to call it, into our world and it having the ability to change and modify DNA, even combining DNA to make something better out of it which we're going to get to here in a minute. But if you watch this movie in the beginning, this ooze gets sort of poured out onto these plants, right? There was like this toxic spill or whatever, right? Like the, I just thought of the toxic Avenger. Uh, there was this toxic spill and these dandelions, this guy right here, he walks right up to him and he goes, dandelions, right? He picks them up. They're clearly gigantic. This ooze, which I'm saying is plasma, was completely responsible for mutating these tiny little flowers and turning them into something gigantic. So that's a part of the plasma apocalypse theory as I present it, is when the, when the hole in the sky opens up and the plasma comes down, our world will no longer be, be pressurized, it'll be depressurized, and there's going to be a lot of things that will contribute to longer life and gigantic growth. That totally reminds me of Magic. <laughs> like there was, a, so there's a there's a card game called Magic, right? Which I love, and there was this one video game version of it that came out, and there's a spell you could cast on your little guys, and it goes gigantic growth or giant growth or whatever it was. It's cool as green spell. Anyway, all right. So um, the plasma is directly responsible for the gigantic growth of these dandelions, just like the gigantic growth of the turtles and of Master Splinter. Right here's Master Splinter right here. Now in the in the in the cartoon version, he was a rat that was. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. He was a person. His name is uh, Hamato Yoshi, and he's a person that was around a rat or something like that. Anyways, basically the ooze is plasma, and the plasma is what fused to fused together the DNA. And he says, do not confuse the specter of your origin with your present worth, Master Splinter, my sons. <laughs> Remember that part when he comes up out of the bonfire and they're all looking for him. They don't know where he is. They think he's dead. And he's like, 
It's good to see you, my sons. I cried. I cried so hard, dude. I was like, oh, Master of Splinter, I love you. <laughs> All right, we talked about Pinocchio. We talked about the play Rhinoceros. This is from Conan, uh, Conan the Barbarian, where you had <laughs> Darth Vader. No, it's, uh, what's his name? Something Jones? I forgot his name. Anyway, you got this guy right here literally changing into a snake in the movie. Okay. Don't have much else to say about that right now, but there does seem to be a tree of life right behind him, and the tree of life is plasma shooting up from the middle of our world. This is an interesting find. This is a cool breadcrumb that I found right here. This is an old Action Comics uh, Superman 12 cents. Can you imagine that? 12 cents, dude, for a comic book. Dude, comic books nowadays cost at least five bucks a pop, okay? That's 12 cents right there. That's amazing. Anyway, let me zoom in on this so you guys can see it a little better. So how does this relate to the plasma apocalypse and to people changing into animals, right? See this weird serpentine animal being thing here? This is actually Superman, right? I know, I mean, Superman seems to be right here as well. So I don't know. I haven't read the comic book, but I can tell you what it's about because I researched it, all right? Uh, this guy, this animal says, because I'm destroying the statue of myself. Oh, that's a statue down there. Okay, cool. Um... They all think I'm a menace, even Supergirl. Yet, if my plan works, they'll realize that I'm actually Superman. Now, read this part right here. See what happens when red kryptonite... Let's put that in some serious wannabe quotation marks. Red kryptonite changes Superman into the monster from Krypton. Okay, interesting. So, even Superman gets changed into this sort of animal, monster, fantasoid, whatever you want to call it, right? And uh, I think it's interesting they chose to put red kryptonite changing him. The green kryptonite weakens him. So, let's think of the, some symbols that are red and green that have to do with the plasma apocalypse, right? That could possibly be talking about affecting people slash alien beings, basically, or bipedal fantasoids, right? Um, the, the red kryptonite is plasma. I'm just going to say it, okay? Red kryptonite equates to plasma, basically. The green is like the aurora, the aurora borealis, right? Which takes away his power, makes him more normal, right? All right, let's get to this one right here. Who knows what movie this is from? Let's see who can get it first in the chat. Oh, James Earl Jones, thank you. Loon Through the Ether said James Earl Jones. That's That was the name of the snake dude in uh, Conan the Barbarian. And then there was that one black chick that was like super Amazonian. Like, man, she was like strong. <laughs> All right, so this is one of the pods. I don't know if anyone's going to guess it because there's a delay between when I talk and when you guys hear it. Oh, Sam Yaza super got it and even put some... Some neon lightning bolts right next to it. Nice one. All right, so yes, this is from the movie The Fly with Jeff Goldblum, right? If you've never seen The Fly, good old Jeff Goldblum right here is a scientist. He gets into these pods and he's, he's, he's working on teleportation basically, but it, he accidentally discovers something else other than teleportation. What happens is there's a fly that goes into this pod with him and this machine that he's in right here it reads the the DNA that of everything in the pod and it tries to make it better. So it's supposed to make him healthier and stronger and live longer and all the things that we do talk about are which are byproducts of the plasma apocalypse, right? But the other thing was he had this uh, closeness to this foreign DNA. So it took the foreign DNA and uh, basically, as you can see, through electrical or plasma, uh, influx merged the DNA. It rewrote the DNA. It changed the DNA so that he no longer was human, but he started to change into something else. In this case, it's not an animal. Okay. I don't know if flies are, I don't, I mean, they're considered insects, right? But who cares? I mean, we really can't stop and just say, oh, this only applies to animals. No, man, this applies to all kinds of stuff, right? And he says, I'm becoming Brundlefly. Right, which is a mix of his human name, Brundle, and uh, a fly, basically. Look at him. He's literally going through a metamorphosis. He's going through a transition into something else because he was exposed to this influx of plasma in this little sealed-off 
domed world chamber, right? There's a lot of truth in these movies. And it's really interesting, too, because he actually gets a lot of superpowers, too. Okay, so if you don't end up changing into some something else, you're basically going to be a superhero version of yourself or supervillain if you choose to be. Uh, this is from Ghostbusters as well. Remember I said they changed into dogs or devil dogs or uh, hellhounds or whatever, I, which I believe are a class of phantasoid, by the way. I think I've said that before, but I definitely think that hellhounds are a class of phantasoid. All right, let me see what else I got. This is from Love, Death, and Robots. There's this huge thing about this lady wanting to be an animal and changing back into an animal. They use technology to help her out to turn back into this uh, dog thing. And this is kind of funny. I just like these robots from Love, Death, and Robots. He's like, who even, who even designed these humans? These robots are talking about like how bad of a design the human body was and like what their problem was. They're just they're just kind of gossiping about humans like, man, like I mean, I would too, right? This is after the apocalypse basically, right? Why are there robots, sentient robots, one of them that only has one eye, by the way, uh talking trash about all these humans about in the pre-apocalyptic world? Well, that's because the plasma comes in, the influx of electromagnetics magnetics come in and bring life to these robots. It's what brings things to life, not GE, plasma. <laughs> I know, I'm full of corny jokes today. So this guy says, it's unclear. We checked their code. No creator signature. <laughs> All right, there's some more werewolf examples. We've got the ancient gods. This might be it. Uh, yep, the green monkey. That's where we left off. All right, cool. So let me get rid of that. Let me go ahead and... Well, where's my background? Isn't there a background? There's got to be a background. The slideshow's gone. So what's in the background? Nothing? I totally had something in the background. Well, I don't know if I did or not. Let me see. I got to put something back there. It looks weird just being all black. Plasma, no, that's not it. New member, no, no, no. Black line, no, no, no. Fantazoid, the jar, no. Webcam, nothing, nothing. Okay, well, that's fine. That's uh, totally cool. We're going to wrap things up anyway. Um, hey, everybody in the chat, I want to say thank you. I appreciate that you guys are in there adding to the conversation, uh, leaving links, leaving your own examples of people turning into animals and your own plasma apocalypse stuff. Oh, Grace Jones, you're totally right. It was Grace Jones. Man. Oh, nobody got the movie, by the way. The movie quote was from a really good movie that has examples of many of these plasma apocalypse things. It's a cheesy movie. It's an older movie, but I love it. I highly recommend checking out Waxworks. Okay. And I'm not talking about the Wax Museum one with Paris Hilton or whatever that was. Okay. I'm talking about the old movie called Waxworks. Okay. That's a classic one. It's got a lot of cool stuff in it. Um,. We didn't have any callers today. So see up here, I've got this little Skype deal over there in the corner. So when that's up there, that means you can call in. And I'm, I'm pretty much going to leave that up there for the most part unless we get too many calls, in which case I'll, I'll take breaks from that, okay? Uh, nobody called in today, but there is a, a membership tier where if you'd like to, you can call in during any of my live streams. And I kind of perfected it earlier, so it is working now. We don't have to play with it anymore. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go. I'm going to go have fun with my family tonight. I'm glad you guys joined me for this particular episode. I've been waiting to do this one for a while. Uh, feel free to leave the comments. The comments are open now. Uh, the videos, this video is going to be available to the public and everything. And um, check out my website too if you want, jdreamers.com. Until next time, I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. We'll see you guys next time. There's no outro. I, I totally, there's not even, hold on, let me see if I could add the credits. Jesus, I didn't even put the credits. Actually, no. No, we're not ending this yet. Let me put in the credits real quick. I thought I had the credits in here. I could totally put them in. It takes like two seconds. Let's see here. We're going to go to boom. This, this, and that, and that one right there. Um, we're going to go new. We're just going to add that. We're going to go there. All right, 10 more seconds. Oh, now I got pressure on myself. I'm just kidding. There we go. Boom. There it is. Okay. I couldn't say goodbye over the credits, okay? I'm Jay Dreamer saying good vibes and goodbye. We'll see you guys on Monday when we do our Ancient Oblivion series. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.